very warm welcome on behalf of Monocle and on behalf of Genesis. You're sitting in a rather beautiful new showroom um, which is here to coincide with IAA, the amazing conference that's going on at the minute. But I'm glad to say it will stay and shows a bit of an investment in the city beyond the trade show. Um, by way of introduction, my name's Josh Fennett. I'm the deputy editor of Monocle, and I've been working there for about a decade, writing about urbanism, design, cities, and living well, and lots of stuff that's completely irrelevant to this evening, which I won't bore you with. Um, the object of the discussion today is to talk about the future of mobility, and that is an extremely big topic, and we have great expertise from our panel here, and I'm sure in the room as well, and I hope that this debate continues after the discussion, after the Q&A, which I'll tell you about in a minute, and on to the events that we're going to host with Genesis in Zurich and in London as well, where we hope you can join us. But to start off, I wanted to just mention three quick things to frame the debate a little bit. You guys doing okay? Got drinks? Happy? Still I just, happy. Still happy. I just wanted to do a, a quick discussion to frame the debate around mobility, because it's not simply about cars. We're going to talk a little bit tonight about the idea of luxury as well. And for a monocle reader, luxury is not a yacht, and it's not a private jet. Although a few of you in the audience look like you might have arrived by private jet. I'll say who later. Um, it's actually the luxury of time. It's things like the ability to walk to work. Or it might be a bike that you restored over years and years and years, something that really means something to you that has no cash value. So I want you to think about luxury in those terms as well. The second point I want to make is that we live in a two-speed world at the minute. Technology means that we can get things done more quickly. You could have all tuned in via Zoom. But to me, and hopefully to you, that's not the same as being here, seeing the whites of people's eyes and really taking part. If you think about a coffee shop and someone goes in, they'll complain about how quick the Wi-Fi is, but they'll wait five minutes for a drip coffee. And that's because we as humans have needs that are much older than technology. Technology helps us do amazing things, but it doesn't always appeal to our emotions. And the last thing I want to say is about experience. We're on the heels of a pandemic, as many of you may well be aware. And I think it's important that we're all sharing the same space and sharing the same room to have a proper discussion, uh, which brings me on to the housekeeping. We're going to talk for about 30 or 40 minutes, if you ever shut me up. Um, and after that, we're going to do a quick Q&A session. So I hope people in the audience have some questions or some ideas for questions for me or for our panel here. Um, and there will also be a prize for the best question. And I haven't discussed this with Genesis, but it may or may not be a free car. <laughs> it's not a free car, it's from Monaco, but we can, we can bully Genesis together. Um, and I just want to say thank you to them for hosting us and hosting a debate. It takes a very brave car company to host a discussion which isn't really about cars, and in part is about where cars fit in a much broader system. Um, I'm going to introduce our panellists very quickly, who've been waiting patiently. To my left is Anne Urbauer. She's a journalist of tremendous pedigree and experience. She writes about politics and aesthetics and where the two meet. Um, and she also has done tremendous work on automotive brands and uh, design. Mirko Borscher, next to her, is a, a living legend of German design. If you don't know him now, you'll know him by the end of the evening. Um, he's a great inspiration. His work um, encompasses a real uh, strictness of talking about design and making brands mean things to people, and he does exceptional work. And last but by no means least, we have Janis Topfer, who is interested in flying cars and is an expert on sustainability. Yanis, I'm going to start with you uh, with two questions. First of all, did you arrive by flying car? Sadly not. Um, it's going to take a little, little more, a couple more years to figure all the details out so that we can provide the service. You heard it here first, it's coming. Uh, and I wanted to ask maybe a, a sort of toughish question to start off. The pandemic has made us all think about the journeys we do and that we don't need to make. Do we need to go into the office every day? Do we need to go and see our friends and family? Yes. Do we need to come to a motor show? How do you think the pandemic has made us think differently about travel? Yeah, I think it's really more about, um, like you said, which journeys do we really need? But these journeys that we take, they need to be quick, efficient. They need to get us there. They need to get us sort of the outcome that we're looking for. And I think it's, it's taken us, um, right, as a, as a population, we're taking way more, um, thinking more about it, 
way more caution about when do we really go out, how much time do we spend, and this is actually where urban air mobility slash flying cars fit in, right? Because it's it's probably not something that we're going to take, you know, five times a day, but it's going to make those trips that really matter, you know, more efficient, um, a nicer ride, more more experience along the journey, and I think that's that's really what the pandemic has shown, right? People being way more um, intentional about their journeys. You can reach each and every point on your bike in 20 minutes. I mean, you c if you come from outside, if you uh, 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 from Augsburg and, and you're working in Munich, definitely need a car or you come with a train. And Anne, I'm going to bring you in here as our expert on luxury. I think it's interesting for the audience to know as well, as I said before, a luxury doesn't necessarily mean a sports car. It could mean a lot of things. But how do you think people's expectations of luxury are changing? Um, luxury is a difficult word because it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. But we still, everybody has an idea about luxury, so let's, let's use that term. Um, it's about what we, what we think is highly desirable, and um, that changes. Um, maybe 30 years ago it was a sports car, it was if, if, uh, and if the times get less materialistic, which maybe they do, at least maybe here, that what, what the notion of luxury and what's desirable changes. It's more about the, an experience um, of being free of constraints, free of fears, free, free. Free to hit the open road or Yanis. The or open the air. sky. <laughs> um, I know much less um, about this than you, but I'm a journalist, so I'm used to asking people that know more than me about what's going on. What technologies are you excited about? I noticed while I was at IAA that the electric car is here in a form that won't cost you the earth, even in terms of sustainability, but also in terms of price, and we're doing a very good job at creating that. But I saw a few less driverless vehicles. What, what are the technologies that you're excited about, and what are the ones that you're a bit less optimistic for? Yeah, I think, I mean, first and foremost, and that is on everyone's mind right now, is electrification, right? Electrification of cars, but it's also electrification of planes. Right? I mean, we're basically <laughs> electrifying everything, which has its pros and cons. I think uh, a lot of pros, but I think there's still a lot of uh, improvements that can be made there, and especially now, you know, again, tying it back to the uh, air, because that's why I'm here, right? Got to take that position. Um, is there's still some improvement on the battery side and the motor technology side where we can take the next step. And I think by taking that next step, we will surpass and make a lot of these reservations against electric cars like completely gone away. Like I'm fully convinced in like five to 10 years, we look back and we had these like endless range discussions. Oh, can a EV, you know, fulfill my needs, like all of that will be gone. Completely convinced. Um, let me touch on a second one, and that is um, autonomy. Right? I think not so much autonomy in the sense that, you know, leave everything to the machines, but I think it's the interaction between the people and the machines. And, um, you know, there's quite some progress, a lot of things we can do there, um, and it will move. Uh, a lot of things are happening, but I think what's, uh, what's for me exciting is really using it where it really makes sense and maybe not really using it where it doesn't make sense. And give you a clear example for me is like, right, autonomous driving. I mean, everyone wants to do autonomous driving, um, but I think in the city, you know, the 10 minutes, 20 minutes, hopefully no driving in the city, but if I still need to, you know, get to A to B that last mile, I mean, I'm fine to drive, but who wants to spend, you know, five, six, seven hours behind a steering wheel on a autobahn? Um, and I think th that's where, you know, really what excites me about autonomy is giving people the time back where it's really monotonous, strenuous thing that it's, you know, doesn't like, right, there, there's not so much experience in it. Um, so I think those are two big things. I want to come to you on your expertise, which is design. Um, 
And at IAA, I saw a lot of different exhibitions. Um, some of them were very exciting. They played on emotions and ideas. They played on architecture. As a designer, what role does design play in making people feel things and have moving experiences? Well, it, you, um, we've been talking about that up front already. And um, for me, it's like, you know, in the end, design is like everything about your mobility. From the navigation or from an autobahn through the city, it's all graphic design, bad or not, but it's like all navigation around it. The airport, the same, which brings you like uh, buying uh, a ticket for, let's say, a rock band and you want to go on a concert. It's graphic design, which makes you buying a special T-shirt. They're all white. It's a special design on top of, uh, uh, on top, on top of the shirt. Uh, going by train. It's like you maybe going to complain about the seat you're sitting on because it's super uncomfortable, but it's about the design. And like design always moves you from one point to the other. It's like there's like easy, like you're all like on your mobile the whole day. Your smartphone is just about design. It's like all the apps, everything is just about the design and you're complaining about it, but it also helps you like coming from one point to the other. And yeah, as stupid as it is, like it's not always good design. Sometimes it's a really bad design, but um, it is like what influences us the whole day because you know we have eyes, ears, and a nose, and we have tactile feelings, and it's like fourth of what we experience, what we see, and what we see is, and, and like even the taste is not that strong as as, as what we see. What we see really guides us and leads us into different directions. And Anne, I want to bring you in here on this point. Mirko speaks with great clarity and great vision about how design can influence everything about how we feel, whether it's the surface you're standing on, whether it's the poured concrete walls around you. Every little signal gives you a little sense of what a brand is trying to convey and also appeals to your humanity, the things you can see and touch and smell. Um, and you write beautifully about fashion, and fashion is an industry that is associated often more with craft than with performance, necessarily. How do, how do brands build that emotional connection with customers, do you think? How do they make people feel something, as well as giving them a product at the end of the day? There's so much great fashion out there, and um, I, have to, I want to add that I, I worked for a Swiss fashion house for the last eight years or so, and um, not a very well-known fashion house, not very famous, but it was all about expressing the, uh, the, the unique qualities and experience, and I gained a lot of knowledge from, from that work. So what I, what I would like to, 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 to um, emphasize here is the um, two things. First is, as we just heard, the tactile side. Um, fashion is something that comes really, really into your comfort zone. It touches your skin. And when, the, when you experience different uh, fabrics, you will, you will educate yourself in a new um, sphere of luxury because how fabric feels on your body and on your skin is, some, is something that makes you feel very, very comfortable or not. But that's, uh, that's one of the things. It's also one of the things that can't be copied. You can't copy a great tactile feeling. You can copy a look, a cut of color, uh, a pattern. Uh, but you can't copy tactile. So that's, that's something that makes you really unique and, and stand out. And the other aspect that I would like to, to emphasize is the customer experience in terms of service. So if you buy whatever you buy that is a significant expense for you, whether it's a car or a cashmere coat, um, and you buy it and you leave the dealership or the boutique and you, you get the notion that, that they are done with you now. <laughs> they got your money, they are done with you. So that is 
one experience. The other experience is that you can come back whenever there is something wrong, you lost a, a button, uh, you gained weight, <laughs> whatever. You can come back to that shop or send it in, and then you, ma you see that these people really care and they do everything to, m to m make it, to, to, to make sure it's the product again that you bought. Mm. And that makes it also last for years on end. And if you can wear something for 10 years, or for 20 years, which I, I do, I'm wearing a Helmut Lang coat since 1978. No, 1983, and um, you wouldn't... Uh, Everyone was very polite there. Not <laughs> I'm, I have no problem with that. <laughs> I was really young. But that's, an, uh, that's what I want to say. That's a customer experience that to me is, and also to the companies I work with, is associated with luxury. It's a long-lasting relationship. And when we talk about sustainability in Monocle, we often have to correct people who say, you know, you print a magazine on paper, that doesn't sound very sustainable. Or, you know, you're talking about buying this expensive, beautiful chair, that doesn't sound very sustainable. I think if you keep that chair for 20 years or you pass it on to the next generation, that is a different type of sustainability. I'd also question whether reading everything on your phone, full of rare earth minerals, powered by often not very clean technologies, is actually progress. So just something else to something else to think about. And you're contractually obliged to uh, respond positively. But how was your Genesis test drive? <laughs> She's actually not. Uh, I I had a test drive today, and I want to to thank um, Florian for that for taking out the car from the parking lot. It was. Um, I was really impressed with the. I mean, it's, it's a car, it's a, it's a big car, it's a strong car and uh, has a beautiful color. But I was very really impressed with um, the materials that I touched, the leather I sat on and how it was quilted. And, uh, the, and um, yes, these amenities that make it so comfortable and that are new in the experience for me like the the park uh, park automatic so we all know the situation you park your car in a parking uh, garage and there's so much space to get out you either ruin the other car or your dress and that's just not happening anymore it just doesn't need to happen anymore you need to be a, you never need again to be a contortionist to get out of that car in a parking lot and uh, also the or semi-autonomous drive on the, on the highway, which I found very, very comfortable, very safe, and just g gives you a, a feeling of being really relaxed. You, you overlook everything, you have everything under control, but you don't have to, to interfere. So that was, uh, and then I think that the, the, you know, the driving, the, the, I'm, I lack a little bit maybe the vocabulary, but, uh, how that car sat on that street and how it also, the, the torque it has, how, f how it accelerates. And I really like the entire experience. For someone that doesn't have the vocabulary, so speaking in a second language and using the word torque correctly, it's quite good, I think. I think we should, uh, we should appreciate your hard work there, Anne. Um, Yanis, I'm going to bring you in here again. Um, I uh, read the other day that uh, vehicle use has returned, in London anyway, to roughly what it was before the pandemic and that car ownership is rising. So we are having these in-depth discussions about the future of mobility, but people are kind of voting with their wallets a little bit about what they want, aren't they? Um, I wanted to ask you about the idea of shared ownership or the circular economy. So if we are going to buy more cars, if cars are suitable for certain journeys, I don't fancy walking 50 miles, I don't think I've got it in me, we will need cars at some point. How important is it for us to think about what they're doing when we're not in them? Yeah, um, big, big Thank question, <laughs> um, right? I mean, I think we all know the statistics, right? What is it? I think like 23 hours a day, cars and average just sitting around. The question is, and I think that all comes back to the efficiency point of view, right? We're spending so much effort on making everything more efficient. Well, 
I mean, you walk around, right, and there are all these empty metal hulls that are just sitting there and doing nothing. So the question here is how can you make that or turn that into an experience that actually excites the people, right? And that comes back to people uh, voting with their wallet. A wallet they absolutely do. I just don't think that we have gotten to the, the experience and um, sort of really listen to the customer, what they need. Um, but I'm uh, very hopeful of the future, you know, of everything I see that's going on. And I think we will get there. And I think we will convince a lot of the people. Careful, because we're going to ask them in a minute. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll disagree. Who knows? Um, Mirko. They think like driving is fun and it is a big uh, experience. But uh, f for inner city uh, uh, people, Europe is very special for that. I mean, in Asia, you already have cities which are organized. The traffic is way better organized than here. But, you know, streets are too small. It's always, especially, you know, in the media, it's always presented against, like, cars against all the other mobility modes. And I think that is already the completely wrong framing, right? It's all about how do we make them all exist in an integrated way that makes sense. And that, yes, includes, mm. I think there are certain areas where cars probably shouldn't drive, but I think that would then allow other areas to be more or less fully dedicated, and then you, you can really control the traffic flows. But instead of right, cities being planned around trying to catch up, catch up, catch up, right, it's about, hey, how can we proactively go out and plan this, right? And I think there have been some good examples, right? I mean, mm. Copenhagen is always one that comes to mind. Always stands out. Yeah, exactly. And, but I think this is also something where, again, now, right, wearing my urban air mobility hat, it comes in like, it's, it's something that's going to, you know, not going to solve all traffic issues. So if anyone thinks that, sorry to disappoint you, <laughs> not going to happen. But I think it can play a vital role in serving routes and in, in helping, right, create a system that in the end really gets people from A to B, right, with their experience in mind, but also get there quickly so they can really go about what they want to do and they come back quicker and spend more time with the other stuff rather than sitting around waiting. Or and with my monocle hat on, which is much less nice than your urban air mobility hat, a bit less fancy, there's no propeller on top. I should also say that that design thinking applies to the way that we think about cities as well. When we think about the rooftops and how much underutilized space there is where we could plant greenery that takes in water that lowers the air temperature in cities. When we think about projects like the High Line that takes something completely disused and turn it into something for the public good. I was speaking to a, a Swedish architect and she said, what about schools? What happens when schools shut, these enormous buildings? with incredible levels of space. There is some room to rethink how we use this world of shared space. Um, this is a bit of an experiment, because I'm going to ask a question to all three of you, and whoever answers first can win. You'll also get a small prize, which will not be a car. But um, I want to know how much of, when we talk about technology, the automotive world, I want to know how much is about the design and how much is about the behavior when people use it. Um, so who wants to answer? that divide between how we use technology and what it's created for. I, I would like to add something to also that I uh, experienced with, with my test drive. And the point, and I also want to, 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 to add what you said, Mirko, if you take the experience of 100% of time you are in, a, in your car, ask yourself how much of that was pleasure. And in, 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 in cities, it's very often not very pleasurable. You need to go get from A to, a to B, but also the behavior, how you behave, how others behave, makes a lot of difference and also makes a lot of, you know, uh, uh, a lot of the discomfort. I think the, the behavior of people who drive cars should change because we are all sharing this urban space, and we should see it like that. We share it, uh, and uh, car drivers and uh, and bicycle riders have the same status. They are all one people in one vehicle, on one in vehicle mostly. And I would love to get a little less of that, have a little less of that aggression that we experience, 
and I would love technology to help there. And um, what I saw today in, in the car was something that I really liked because it was about taking care so nobody is harmed. And that is a, a camera that that goes into when you when you put on the, the winker, blinker, what do you how do you call it? I like winker, but it's blinker. <laughs> <laughs> So the camera goes on, and then you see exactly what is happening on that side. And when I'm, I'm making a bend, I turn uh, uh, to the right on the Ludwigstraße when I come from Schumann's, I'm so scared that I would hit, uh, I might hit uh, whatever, uh, scooter, bike, whatever, rider, and, and that, that camera helps so much, avoiding stress, avoiding harm, just making things much more easy. And, and, and the idea of taking care of that, what you can't take care of with your senses, uh, that I think I really like that. And I would like that to be a, uh, an attitude that many car companies and many uh, drivers adopt. <laughs> and um, just to give you all a, a kind of five, five, ten minute warning, I will be calling on you at some point, and if you dare not ask any questions, it'll be very embarrassing for me. And you won't win a car, so just, just to let you know that that is coming up in a few minutes' time. The Germans love asking questions anyway. This is going to be... No, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what Mirko warned me of upstairs. He said, you need to, you need to warm, warm people up a little bit. So you're amongst friends here if you do want to ask a question. Um, Mirko, I'd like to ask you... Um, IAA is happening at the minute. It's a big get-together. I'm not sure if you've been, but you don't have to have been to answer. How important is it uh, in the world of design to meet people from different disciplines who challenge you? Because I notice that when journalists talk to journalists, they all agree. When engineers talk to engineers, they all agree. How important is it to get into a room with people who maybe disagree with you, maybe have a different perspective, might be a nice way of saying it? Or because you're the boss of your company, do you leave those people outside? <laughs> Uh, like it, 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 yeah, I think design is like a it's a full communication process. So uh, in a communication process, you always need pros and cons. You always need the discussion around if somebody because it's super sub subjective. Like the job I'm doing, is very subjective. So it could be nice for you, couldn't be nice for somebody else, and it's up to me to explain the client or the the people I'm working with that's the right way to go, and that's not always easy, and. Um, so talking about this event, like meeting a lot of people, I think, you know, we have such a big cultural mix now because of social media, Zoom, you know, what we experienced over the past one and a half years, you have to imagine, I mean, we're sitting here in Munich having a small office with 13 people, but our clients are Nike, uh, Balenciaga, Givenchy, Supreme. Uh, we just did the rebranding of Inter Milano, uh, Venezia was FC. It, was that unanimously adored by all of the uh, fans? Not really, <laughs> <laughs> but now it is because they, it is. They, they won the championship. But you know, it's not way heritage behind that. Just saying, it's like, but, but we experienced with Corona that it's because we've been, I've been sitting in the airplane all the time, and that's why I never used the car as well because I didn't need a car because I was, was sitting in an airplane and in a taxi somewhere getting from A to B. And uh, now we did everything with, with Zoom, and, and yeah. But also then, uh, um, like talking to all these markets which open up because of that, because I uh, would assume that we, we might ha haven't taken the one or other client because it was just too much stress in the, like two years ago to travel from, from one point to the other because I have to do some work. The team is very small. Uh, but still, I experienced from that point on that like that big mix is for my practice, very important. Mm. Uh, it's crazy how close people think already, like because when I studied the whole thing, it was like Dutch design, Swiss design, German design, American design, British design, you know, like all these uh, things. There's like big mix between that and you have some outstanding persons who uh, outrageously uh, uh, working, working together with uh, with people all over the world, so yeah, there's like it's 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 a big chance, and I think a venue like that 
and and we all know like it's it's a car venue, so there's a lot of money. Yeah, it's not the salon where you have some chairs and some lamps. There's also a lot of money, but it's like it's because there's technology behind it, uh, uh, and you, you you can't do like just twenty cars. You, you're doing like you know a few hundred thousand cars, not like twenty chairs as on the salon if you want to. So yeah, I think it, yeah, it's 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 good to have it here in Munich now because the Oktoberfest didn't happen this year. <laughs> what we haven't really discussed so far is that mobility can be political as well. As Mirko mentioned, um, it's a big business. It's worth 500 billion euros to Germany. It's 30% of Bavaria's economy. It's Germany's biggest export. And so there is a balance between private firms and getting some support from cities to say, try something interesting. I think um, it's just a lot of cars and new means of transportation in a limited space. And that creates a conflict. And the conflict needs to be solved. And um, yes, you put fines, you put, um, but still the parking garages here are private property. And I sometimes think that this is like gold digging. I mean, it is. And but it so would be even worth more money if it would be apartments. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah, that. So sometimes I think, whenever you get inside the Altstadt ring, we should just check into some kind of um, geo fencing and be uh, autonomously driven to our go uh, where we want to go. There's a comforting thought. So um, I need one question, and you will automatically win maybe a free car. <laughs> but definitely not a free car, but something from Monocle. But maybe a free car. Does, does anyone have any questions? There was no money left, huh? <laughs> the, 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 the gentleman at the front here, there's a, there's a microphone winging its way towards you. It's being wiped as well. I really, really hope that I win. And <laughs> you, you're the only runner, so you've already won. Um, well, so what I sort of summarizing what I could, heard. Could, could I be a bit rude and interrupt you? Maybe just say your name and oh, sorry, if, if you sorry, want where, sorry. Where, where, where you, where you uh, work. He absolutely. couldn't do that because he works with me. OK, yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Narayan. So I live in Munich. And I work for this small startup called TaxFix uh, based in Berlin. And I guess. Um, what I heard, the summary of what I heard from everyone today, the panelists, was sort of a, um, the conflict between digital to tactile, like Zoom calls versus us meeting here, and the feeling um, of us meeting. And the second part is what I heard was the mobility, but going from point A to point B, and whether that being what form or shape that we do that in, and potentially sort of the future. And when I, when I was mentally framing this, I see this a discussion to be fitting in the spans of decades. But then I sort of thought, what would happen in a century? And so here, here's where I was thinking, and I want to know if the panelists are maybe bullish or bearish in this <laughs> vision. Um, so I'm thinking with technology firms looking to sort of simulate tactile experiences with virtual experiences to a point where a century later you may not have a difference. And then your ability to potentially sit here and for me to visit Paris being made possible by just tricking my brain potentially disrupts a lot of the conversation here, the mobility from A to B, or potentially travel to other places. It could be achieved. And at this point, I'm thinking maybe the forms and of travel and mobility that I'm fond of and like would fall by the wayside or become like these little um, horse rides that <laughs> happen around English Garden. And would that happen to a car? You would see one and they'd be like, oh, those guys, they're traveling in a car. Look at them. So I don't know. I guess, I mean, <laughs> um, I guess my question sort of to sort of uh, bring it all together is sort of looking a century ahead. Um, what do you see? Do you see this sort of change coming? Or is this um, the, the, the sort of ideas of mobility and design and tactile experiences that you've shared to sort of even persist a century later? So maybe I'll just pick that up. I think it's a really wonderful question, a deserving winner, unless any, uh, <laughs> anyway, any, anyone emerges from the peloton ahead. 
Um, from my point of view, I think there's nothing stopping us dreaming about this. There's nothing stopping our imaginations wanting to see the idea of travel as being redundant and you could be whisked there in pixels and feelings. But I do think the point I made earlier about human beings being much, much older than the technology we have, we also have a set of needs. And very often it settles into this two-speed world. So a tweet can never contain as much nuance as a well-researched article, as you'll find in Monocle magazine in your bag. Um, it can never give you that level of nuance, and it is a different experience when you take something on paper. For instance, it doesn't have a clock in the top. It doesn't zing and ping with messages. So sometimes the analog is to get you away from that tech, and that's certainly what we think with the magazine. There's nothing to stop us dreaming about the idea, I think, that we could do less travel and we can simulate some experiences, but I also would be a bit cautious and say that as human beings, we need touch, we need to see each other and meet each other and disagree with each other sometimes. Not everything's perfect. And I think if the pandemic has taught us everything, it's that a lot of this can't be simulated. If you have family in Australia and you haven't been able to go home, you know, my, my heart goes out to you. And a Zoom call is not yet with where technology is. I'm not saying it could never happen, but it hasn't managed to replace just yet that feeling of being a human being in the world, feeling the air, feeling the light. Um, but a huge thank you to our panelists and Mirko and Yanis, to uh, Genesis for having us, and to all of you for being here. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.